and welcome back to Masters of Modern. I am your host, Alex Kessler, with my co-host, Ben Bateman. What's up, everybody? I'm not in a suit. I'm not anything. I'm in a, a pattern t-shirt. It's like maybe the first time it's ever happened on the show. Is that a Motley Crue t-shirt? It's an authentic tour shirt from wow. 1983. Wow, you got a bike behind you. Uh, yeah. You got stuff. Yeah, this is your, this is the home. This is the home we live in. We're dealing with in my like home. The, the COVID thing. You got, we got an Infinity Gauntlet, uh, a Lego Millennium Falcon. We have nice. uh, a Baby Yoda. Or no, it's just a regular Yoda. A regular Yoda canvas painting over there. Uh, and um, yeah, and, and today, uh, this is the Bachelor Modern Podcast. We talk about all of the modern things under the sun. Um, we are uh, finishing, this is part three of our set review for um, Ikoria, uh, the layer of behemoths, I think is the side writer of the, uh, the thing. Look at that. Um, and uh, basically we structured each episode a little bit around the different mechanics. We did uh, uh, some of the cycling stuff before. We did some of the... Um, we focused on Companion last week. If you want to hear our thoughts on Companion, we've now done two episodes. One with Shivam Bot, who was on Shivam, uh, was on uh, two weeks ago. And then uh, uh, la- last week we did kind of a review. Now that Companions are out in the wild and doing all of the damage in every format. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Mutate. Uh, a little touch on some of the cyclers we missed, but a big kind of del- de- de- dive down on is Mutate playable in formats outside of Standard and or uh, Limited. It is an extremely fun limited mechanic. It is an extremely complicated mechanic. Uh, so we're going to go over some of the individual cards on that note, and we are also going to uh, break down all the other cards that we missed so far. Uh, the way these, they're normally three-parters for set reviews. Uh, the first two, uh, we covered cards alphabetically. We're going to do the remainder of them that we've missed so far, or any cards that we missed alphabetically that people on the internet were like, hey, uh, you did the bees, and uh, you missed this guy, so you should talk about him. So we'll, we'll cover any of the missed opportunities. And if we missed a card that you like, please comment below. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on what cards we missed. So to get started, just just right into it. Well, before we get right into it, we need to tell you guys that this episode is brought to you by the nobles of the House Modern, which is our Patreon. Brandon S. Russell, Andrew Kelso, and Cam Albergini. Alber- Albergini? Bini? I really hope I got that right. We got to hang out with Cam a little bit on, on the uh, tea time at the Modern House, which is the thing we now do before the show every single week. Um, but I didn't ask the pronunciation of Cam's last name. We mostly talked about playing Blue Red Decks. So next time, next time we'll just make a note to get get pronunciations, right. or just have, like ask to find the breakdown with like the uh, extra punctuation, right? Like in a right, library right, right. book. Yeah, that's that's been a lot of fun getting to talk to our patrons and and uh, get to know them. And you know, uh, we were talking to Andrew a second ago, and he was telling us that he's been playing uh, was it Fire Prophecy. That's the card, right? It's one of the red instant Fire Prophecy deals three damage target creature. You may put a card from your hand on the bottom of your library if you do draw a card. He's saying he's been playing it in in a Belcher deck in Modern because it allows you to put the lands from your hand on the bottom of your library, um, which is interesting. I like that card a lot. We talked about it a little bit on an earlier episode, but it's a burn spell. Um, that lets you loot. It just doesn't let you use it for graveyard shenanigans. I still think that's ex- like it's pretty powerful. I'm, I'm I'm not surprised that it's doing work. Just being able to use your removal to also cycle through your deck is generally powerful. Um, and this one, when it combos with stuff like chart, you know, putting stuff on the bottom of your deck, there's that's a mechanical space that there are ways to break. Um, Grenzo, I think from Con- Conspiracy is another one that like you can cast the card from the bottom of your deck. So if you like cast this. Grenzo then lets you cast that card so you could like cheat stuff into the bottom of your deck, kind of like a graveyard. So it, that's a cool mechanic just in general. So yeah. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's been fun to get to talk to those guys. So uh, thanks for, for the additions to our uh, our episode. And then I think you or I cut you off. You're about to get into a card. Oh, yeah. So the very first card. And in, and uh, these are going to be the beginning of the mutate conversation. So uh, this is Boneyard Lurker, two black and a green. Um, it is mutate for black, green, hybrid, black, green, hybrid, two. Uh, if you cast a spell for its mutate cost, put it over or under target non-human creature you own. They mutate into that creature on top, plus all abilities from under it. Uh, whenever this creature mutates, return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. This is the 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 land, not land of war elf, eternal witness uh, of mutate cards, and it it sizable body, um, probably the fairest of the ones that we're gonna go over, but yep. just just kind of the beginning of, and it's all alphabetical on kind of the conversation around this mechanic. Now, I, I think that, you know, there's definitely Boggles is, is, is a set. Like, it, this has all of the negatives that um, most Aura cards have, other than the fact that it's not a dead card if you draw it late game, right? Like, that, that that's something that I don't think people are talking too much about, is when in that comparison, is, is an Aura, if I draw it without a creature in place, sucks. 
Right. Well, also, and, and my yeah, and my understanding of mutate because again, I actually, to be honest, guys, I've not gotten to play a game of Aquaria yet. It's a different world we're all living in now without physical magic, which is brutal. And I, I am playing on Moto, but like the things I'm playing on Moto are like Modern Cube and Games of Modern, and and uh, so I'm hoping to play with some some Aquaria cards in, in near future. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just don't feel normal about it yet. But anyway, what my point was, my understanding of mutate is that. It is similar to bestow. It's just you don't get the mutate trigger, right? You get you try to mutate and they kill the creature in response. The creature casts, but you don't get the mutate. Yeah, it, it depends, right? It's different in in on the stack, yes, but in once it's in play, if you kill the thing, they both die. Oh, oh, oh! I see what you're saying. So, so, so once it's in play, if you then if you then kill the creature, both yeah. creatures die. You don't, fall. you don't, you don't get them. And and with mutate, almost all of the mutate cards, especially any that would ever see constructed play, have riders on them so you kind of get a card that you cast when you mutate it right like almost all of them have mutate onto this creature uh uh trigger you effect that you yeah. let you that, that that equals about drawing a card or better in some of the cases and uh also modify the creature this mutates onto to either become a higher power and toughness or gain all of these keywords or you know or, or different what have you i mean the 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 mutate card that i'm almost there, there's a few that I'm excited about, but one of them, and it's relevant to this conversation, that I, I think is actually probably pretty cool and, and was down on it until I got to play it, is Gem Razor. This is the three green beast 4-4 four, four, with reach trample. Yeah. Whenever this creature mutates, destroy target artifact or enchantment in opponent controls, and it's green, green one to mutate it. The ability to, A, just play this as a 4-4-4-4 four, 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 reach trample, which is like not the worst stats on a creature I've, uh, uh, on the planet as you, and this is your you know worst case scenario but to be able to turn any one of your one or two drops into a four four with reach and trample for three mana that then also draws you a card by killing an artifact or an enchantment i think that's pretty versatile yeah i mean there are you know it's interesting you think about some formats like modern is pretty artifact heavy like there's definitely a lot of early artifacts that come down in modern and so there's definitely a situation where your turn one noble hierarch turns into a turn two four four hierarch that then kills whatever whether it's like an astrolab which is a pretty like weak sauce thing to blow up probably but like there's a lot of there's just like a lot of things people are doing in modern now modern is not the most like talisman signet heavy format so like that classic sort of play pattern of like i will sh- you know I, you see more of a commander right like accelerants like that classic i will get value off of my mana creature turning into a 4-4 that also blows up a signet uh is not as common but i do think that there's value to it and i agree with you like Similar to, to the card we were just talking about, um, a four 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 used to be a thing that people cared about. That used to be a valuable thing in Magic. It's not as good as it once was. We get five vibes for four often now, but a four 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 is still nothing to sneeze at. So if you actually have that ability to staple a card onto it, I'm, I'm all about it. Yeah, and I think I think that like as a sideboard option in Jund, you know, there's that like generally there's an artifact hate slot, right? Ancient Grudge or something like that. And I can see a meta game where this is under consideration over other options because of the ability to put pressure and apply pressure on, on creatures you're going against, and, and and as well even just like corner caves, right? Like this is a card that you can play for three mana, but doesn't get hit with the cascade from Bloodbraid off. So if you want to be able to target specific things on that cycle, this is an available option. Um, I also think like in those green stoppy decks, those classic green stoppy decks, people like to play so much in modern, the like budget ones. We were playing lots of like four fives for three. Uh, just your 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 elf on turn one turning into this creature on turn two mm-hmm. in a lot of cases, and this is probably not going to be an expensive card. It's pretty valuable, and it's also probably a good thing to have in your side because right. like in general, bringing in just a fatty creature that's going to come down and blow up that piece of hate. And and yeah, elves is another good example, right? Like a mono green having powerful hate cards is not as strong as other colors, and getting the ability to have a card that reads, you know, fight against Urza decks, uh, fight against other artifact control decks, fight against Tron, but also this can be. Uh, just like, oh, I'm playing against a matchup where I need more creatures, or I need I need just like a big beater, or I need to turn my Lana War Elf on turn three into a 4-4, four, four, uh, basically haste, right? That's the other thing that's cool about Mutate, is if you put it on a creature that already had gotten over its summoning sickness, it no longer has summoning sickness. So in many ways, this is a trample reach haste for three mana, uh, as long as you have a creature in play. That's pretty bonkers, Um on its own and then add the fact that you get to destroy one of their one of their um random artifacts i I think there will be a situation that'll happen where somebody's going to cast this on a one one make it into a four four blow up an ensnaring bridge attack for lethal right that's going to be a thing that's going to happen right so i think mono green having access to that's strong 
Um, the the other card that I've gotten the most comments, and we have other ones that we'll go over in the mutate world, but uh, as we go through this, but the next card we're going to talk about uh, is C Dasher Octopus, and this falls into I think my new favorite converted mana cost world, which is the three mana flash blue creature that for another mana cost, often two mana does something else. And that is C Dasher Octopus. Uh, creature Octopus, it is mutate one and a blue. So for two mana, you can mutate it, which is very efficient. Uh, flash, uh, whenever this creature does damage to a player, draw a card. Uh, so if people are familiar with the card Ophidian um, or the 30,000 different versions of this card that they've ever printed, this has those abilities. Giving it Flash is in itself a very powerful effect, right? Like Ophidian with Flash would have been the best creature ever. Like this is a card that printed 15 years ago would have been the best card ever. It would, this would have been, yeah, this would have been the four of copies signed in gold in the World Championship right. deck. That, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like for imagine, sure. yeah, imagine this card existing in 1998. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so my question is that the mutate, you can mutate with flash. Can you mutate for blue one? Mm-hmm, Into the speed. Mm-hmm. So you yes, can do this yeah. when you're, before your creature deals damage. Correct. Yeah, that's so this card is so dope. Like this card is so <laughs> all about this card. Um and like, you know, it, the the thing with the power of the flash, especially in blue cards, is you can hold up counter magic, right? I can leave my hand up, I can say go. You then have to play your turn knowing that one of my options is a counter or a spell. And then when you skip your turn, my option is to play this octopus. Uh does this sound like somebody ahead. that you play against sometimes, maybe that would I'm, like to do things like that? Does it sound like something? <laughs> I'm coming up with this all on my own right now. This has actually never been played in Magic. This concept of, of play style of flash creatures and counter Magic has never existed before. Did you look at this card and go and and go? Well, I'm gonna want to punch Ben in the face. <laughs> I, <love laughs> this card. I mean, I like uh, this is the place that we agree on, right? Like, I'm fine with the cards that seem good that have flash that are two drops and three drops. You just like playing like that, the Eldrazi Infiltrator or whatever. Oh, oh no 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 no! You're you're talking about a uh, uh, dimensional infiltrator. Yeah, yeah I guess yeah, it's yeah. yeah yeah that card that card no, sick. Is it sick? <laughs> <laughs> Look, there, there's a reason they won't print more two one flying flash creatures for two. They're too good. They they, they know if they gave me more of those, it'd be dangerous for magic. I think there are four in like standard as we <laughs> currently stand. <laughs> Not uh, true. I'm telling. I think there's like two. It's like rattle chains and this is, card. Two is a lot. I don't uh, know if there's two gray ogres in standard right now no no no, neither of those let's move on you're just being a hater (laughs) hater hater Uh, hater i'm just saying that card gets printed somewhat often (laughs) uh all right so um yeah i don't know this 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 card just seems awesome i mean like deck wise you have everything from delver style decks that are playing tempo counter magic all the way to fairies all the way to stuff like boggles right like a blue based enchantment deck that's already playing something like curiosity and this just gives a different option that plays a little bit differently you don't get the enchantment pip you don't get the like this is an enchantment in play or you cast an enchantment but you do get the option of like oh now i have a creature in play the next card and this is i guess i'm just going to move through the list and cards i think you're going to see the most played at least amount play that i mutate um regal regal leosaur this is the red white the red white uh dinosaur cat that's a two two um mutate one red white red white whenever this creature mutates other creatures you control get plus two plus two until end of turn um kind of the plus two plus plus two plus one yeah plus two plus one until end of turn now now obviously this doesn't say it's it's other so it's not as good though you can modify things bigger this is just another piece of that cat deck that we've kind of been talking about right And, and dinosaurs like this is both in any type of dinosaur deck or any cat deck we're both kind of in that naya color pattern so this fits right into both and just like can pump your team pretty thoroughly, right? That That's what these kind of decks are looking for, is what does this do differently that's powerful than, say, Merfolk? If that's, like, your base-level creature deck that you have to be better than, and, and Merfolk obviously just has, like, uh, so many lords and so many things that it's going for it. Um, Humans does something different, right? It has more of a hand disruption tempo-based game plan between Thalia's and uh, Kite Self Rebooter, so you're, you're erasing their hand. Uh, what does this card offer differently, or what do cats offer differently than other decks? And between this and Kira, you have a pretty efficient pumping strategy that goes wider than those other decks, right? Like, and I, also you have your and you have your your plus two plus one cat for Monarch Horizons, the three drop is really strong. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, whatever that card, you know, you throw. You mentioned Naya, so obviously you were to throw in the Coddle. Um, and I think you know the, the idea that a deck like a pretty aggressive cat based deck. But does it make you so happy this is a dinosaur cat? Because I feel like it does. That's fine. Um, <laughs> I'm not a cat person. 
We need okay. dogs and magic. Get these hounds out of here. Uh, but I, I like the idea that that deck, which is already going to be pretty aggressive, now has either a bear that's going to get just come down on turn two and get pumped by all the other lords we're talking about. Because like, mm-hmm. think about that. That's a that's a two two for two. That with any with, with your your plus two plus one cat lord on turn three, he's attacking for four the next turn. Mm-hmm. Like that's it's a strong curve when you figure that the late draw of this card is, I'll just mutate this onto a bigger cat, let that cat keep its power and toughness stats. I'll put this under it. And plus two plus one, my whole team. I probably win that turn, right? Like unless unless they've killed a lot of your things. Like, yeah, if you're if you're able to build any amount of a board presence and you can mutate this, you probably win the game. And and your worst case scenario is you just play this on curve, right? As a as a bear for red and a white, and you're just like, oh, I have a two two, it's fine. And then yeah, and, and, cost is very low, yeah. yeah, and if you mutate on this with your second one, you give everything plus four plus four, right? That's something that I guess we haven't talked about is mutate stacks very well, and you're going to have to have a very specific deck that's on that game plan to want multiple mutators. But just having four of one gives you the opportunity in games to draw two, which I think is, this is a good example of where that's powerful. Um, you're saying that if you mutate once on the Leosaur, so now, so now let's say you've got a, or wait, so if, if you Leosaur onto a Leosaur, are you saying you get both triggers? Yes. Wow. So you get plus four, plus two, if you Leosaur a Leosaur. Yes, correct. So if you have a Leosaur in play, or if you mutated Leosaur onto another creature, and then you mutate a second Leosaur cool. onto that creature, you get both triggers. And that's, that's true of all happening. mutate, right? So like if, if you, any of the mutators, if you mutate on them again, you get both triggers. It's whenever that creature mutates. not And mutating is both the action of being mutated onto, as well as being mutating onto something else. That's awesome. That's, that's fantastic. One of the cool things about Mutate is that ability, and, and some of these cards, like, there could be a dedicated version of a Mutate deck that takes advantage of these triggers. That's what the limited deck does, and that deck's a blast, and, and if there's enough efficient Mutators in this format that take advantage of that, that's that's a viable option. How often do you think How often do you think people are going to forget the non human cause of Mutate? All the time. It's already happening. It's, like, already the number one, probably, cause of bad feels. Like, it, it's, it's such a weird... Trinket text that they use for balance purposes, right? This allowed them to make sure there were creatures that like couldn't be mutated onto in the format if it was too good, right? But already people are like, and also like there's a sweet like flavor perspective. Which is good. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why they did it, right? It started like, oh, it doesn't make sense for monsters to be able to mutate onto humans. That's not the story. And they're like, oh, and that also lets us make it so that like the best mana fixer in the format can't mutate so that way that way they can't do what we talked about with lynn or elf of upgrading this card that much right. quicker than than they were before um like uh, uh, sorry another thing that just going back to gem razor because there's just like cool things and i think it's the best for this option uh you can gem razor onto an infect creature sick so you can give a one one plus three plus three permanently and destroy an artifact or enchantment on the sideboard think that's better than the other the elf one right bird incorruptor it's right here thank you marshall <laughs> uh this is why we have an editor um necro panther is the next mutate card two white black white black uh mutate cost it's one black white total cost it's a three three so a three three for three cat nightmare uh whenever this creature mutates target creature card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield return uh target creature card with yeah. converted mana cost three or less so it has it's unearth mutate right yeah, I mean, the thing about this, though, is that, so I, it's, like, fine. It's fine. I, I don't think this card is that good. Okay. I think that it getting back a three drop, not a two drop, is strong. I think that's a, that's a big distinction point for this card. But I do think spending four mana to do that is good, but what you're left with is not that good, unless you're playing a dedicated mutate deck that wants to take advantage of doing this over and over again. Sure, okay. But just, like, it's, it's hard basic cost of, like, I'm going to spend four mana to make something a 3-3 three, three maybe, but mm-hmm. probably the thing that I'm putting it on is at least a 3-3. Three, three. Mm-hmm. So now I'm spending 4 mana to just basically resurrect something and have a body is like not as good as if you think about like Renegade Rallier, that's like what you want to be doing with that kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Rallier or like because um, they've printed a lot of, they've really played down the space the last few years of resurrecting things with CNC basically 3 or less depending on the card, whether it's like Ojatai's Command or Isoret Awakener and you definitely have to, definitely feels like what you need is it to be pretty aggressive on curve, unless you have just like an, you know, obviously the new companion, uh, the white black one, 
Luras. Luras, yeah. Unless it's Luras, which obviously, like, is its own. <laughs> that That's different. Like, Luras is just like, yeah, I'll just do this every single turn. That's insane. But I think the Necropent is a little underpowered. Uh, I think that's fair. I think if, like, you're really... In the long run, if there are reasons to be trying to make Unearth a thing, right, this is a redundant effect. And definitely, in my experience, claim fame... Are, there are moments where just not being able to get a three drop and only having the ability to get two or less like is a negative, and this giving you the ability to, to have that while also having the worst case backup plan of just having a three three for three. Like the, it's the charm mode, right? Like these are in some ways charms where always one of the modes is a boring creature. <laughs> yeah, this just needed this just like needed life link or damage, mm-hmm. like needed it needed an ability as a creature. Sure, I don't I don't disagree with you. So the next thing, and this is I want to kind of talk about as a cycle, because I don't know how good any of them are, but it's the like the mutate cards, right? The five legendary three color creatures. And, and the first one is Vadrock Apex of Thunder, uh, red, blue, white, three, three. Mutate is for four. So it's, it's one of the more inexpensive cards. It's flying in first strike. Whenever this creature mutates, you may cast target non-creature card with a converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard without paying its converted mana cost. So, so hyped on this card. Yeah. I love this card. Yeah, it's really sweet. I mean, the, the A, once again, you mentioned, like, what is the front half, right? And then three mana, like a, 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 what's the, what's the, what's the Mantis Rider? A Mantis Rider that just has flying in first strike versus haste um, is on its own pretty decent. Uh, and then add the fact that just if you have any other creature, this then lets you cast target non-creature spell for free. Um, so, like, this onto a creature gets you bolt. And then now it has haste, right? That's kind of doing the the lightning angel effect. In fact, the back half kind of feels like lightning angel. Lightning angel, yeah. Well, I mean, you also get, so, I mean, yeah, you can get bolt or you can curve out this really nice. So you can also get, like, ancestral vision and any of the free cards. Like, this is totally, this is totally a curve copper if you want it to be in those decks. Mm-hmm. You know? like those, and those decks are already in these colors. Your, your electro dominance and your, your uh, as foretold and your, like, uh, what's the, what's his name? The two mana one three. Uh, Red Horde Arcanist. Mm-hmm. The, you know, like, this, that whole style of deck is again like putting this onto a Dreadhorde Arcanist later in the game that was already going to get that ability to activate, but now your Arcanist is a 3 3 and it flies. So now you're punching in for the bolt they thought they were going to get around, and maybe you're also getting a bolt back, or maybe you're getting back your ancestral vision. Like, well, it feels I mean, like it slots nicely. And Dreadhorde Arcanist wants to be pumped, right? Like now it can cast three drops versus just one drops because it's a yeah. equal to its power. So the fact that you can make it a 3 3, like you can cast that on turn two, cast this. Casting the bolt you played on turn one for free, then swing casting another card for free. Like it, I, I agree, this card's really dope. I really like this card, and it's I also sick. Like, love the art. <laughs> yep, yep. Everything about it is like really sick. Uh, the next card on this cycle is Snapdax Apex of the Hunter. This is the Mardu one. So one red, white, black. Uh, dinosaur Cat Nightmare three five three five double strike. Uh, two black, red, white, white. Uh, something we didn't mention about them, and this is true of all of them, the mutate cost doesn't have to be three colors. So that can be played in a purely blue-red deck. It just Then you can't cast the front half. Or it can be played right. in a purely white-red deck. If it's mutated just for four, I'd be a little bit more hyped. The fact that it costs five mana, which is never going to be cast in modern, to like give something double strike is pretty medium. It does, like for five mana... Give someone double strike and then murder and like double lightning helix or like super lightning helix, right? So that's and like there's, there's something to be said for that big of a swing. Like we saw what happened with um, with uh, Siege Rhino. Like and obviously that's directed to a player, not to a creature. But we know that like that swinging nature of those big big life chunks does matter. But I think I agree five. Yep. The next one is Nethroy Apex of Death. Two white, black, green for a 5-5 five, five Death Touch lifelink. Whenever this creature mutates, return any number of target creature cards with total power 10 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. This card is interesting to me because I'm, I'm like on the front end, a Death Touch lifelink from five for five in these colors does fulfill a role that the like generally does see some amount of play, right? That Modern has seen... The what's the five five the the Obzadat has seen play in modern uh, Siege Rider yeah. has seen play in modern Drag Tusk Drag Tusk has seen play in modern um, wow. and this can fulfill that slot right it's a big five drop that does a lot of damage that gains you life um, but if you're able to do the mutate side which does cost seven so that is a lot you win the game out of like yeah era based I mean so power ten or less from your graveyard to the battlefield so there's a couple there's a couple things to that right uh, the first one is that a lot of the finishers that like elf decks and big green decks have ramped into have power 10 or less, right? So like that uh, Crater Hoof. Crater Hoof's only at 5-5, five, five, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, you can get credit with it. I mean, it's it, more you can get. It's not one thing, right? It's a total. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, I think yeah. I think you could get crater hoof plus like four yeah, elves, four other wins. elves. Yeah, <laughs> and it comes back as wins. I think like that's I, you know one thing that's interesting to point out, Alex. And we talked about this a little bit last week. Been talking about this, but green obviously has been pushed. And I feel like next week's episode should probably just be why green is the best color of magic. I think that that's just a conversation that probably just needs to happen at some point soon because it feels like now when we talk about big green like expensive things. I can't even like turn my nose up at them in the same way that I once did with conscience because it's like they're so much better than the things I like doing. It's so hard for me to win. And when I think about the strategies that are popular and standard that keep getting pushed, it's like, yeah, we're all just gonna play like these things that let us hit lots of land drops and then cast gigantic value things for like eight mana and do it like seven times in the game. And they're these huge, grindy, mm-hmm. mythic rare driven I never would have expected to see that many Cavaliers play as a standard. Like, <laughs> those did not seem like they were that good to me. They seemed fine, I mm-hmm, guess. But, mm-hmm. like, you know, there was, a, like, and, and to me, that seems to be the direction Magic is going. And green is so where that is. So I look at this, I look at this cost of seven to mutate. I'm not saying that it's the first thing I think of doing, but getting to seven mana nowadays. Doesn't not, seem that not impossible. Uh, also, like, it, it's not always seven mana, right? That, that, the problem with seven mana spells are that you'll never cast them. Most games, right? Or 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 the chances you you can't reliably cast that. Um, the the difference with this is this is a five drop, right? You you get you have a five mana life link death touch five drop that'll kill anything that it fights with and then gains you life if 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 you need it. Um, or you cast it and you win the game. You get Malira combo from your graveyard. You get Archangel of Thune from your graveyard with Spike Feeder. You get like the amount of different cards you need, can get with this is is pretty long that just win you the game and. The front end of the option is just a, a medium 5-5 five, five sideboard card, but like the back end as a one of in your deck as a top, and then if you draw it, worst case scenario, you can cast it. It's pretty good. Uh, Brockos, Apex of Forever, two green, blue, 6-6, six, six, Nightmare, Beast, Elemental. Mutate, green uh, two, blue, black, green, green. Uh, trample, you may cast Brockos, Apex Forever, from your graveyard using its mutate ability. So this one's interesting because it has, it's the dredge effect, right? Like you, you mutating, I think does cast as a card. So like having this in a deck that's like trying to get Vengevines back or, or anything that you want to be able to cast a creature from your graveyard is a benefit. Um, it does also just let you like as one of in dredge, let you turn one of your random cards for five mana into a six, six trample haste ostensibly. Um, thoughts. I think it's pretty powerful. I mean, I like the stats. I like a 6-6. Six, six, I like a 6-6 six, six trample for 5 to begin with. It's a good enough card, right? And I especially like that if you dump this in your graveyard as a one of, like, it... Now, I guess, so, like, what, your prized amalgam for 5 gets to become a 6-6 six, six trample is pretty cool. Um, but I also think you don't, like, lose very much of a thing. I guess I think about a dredge deck, I think about any deck like that, like, do they really want to draw this ever? Yeah, I don't, and I feel like that's... I don't think this is as good in dredge as something that, like, is self-milling accidentally, um, or, or self-milling, not accidentally, but more from a value perspective versus a combo perspective. It's yeah. Hard, right? I'm just trying to think, like, would I ever, in one of those, in, in the kind of deck that is either accidentally self-milling or dumping its hand, is there ever a situation where I want to draw this card? I think the answer to that is no. no. So yeah, I agree. I, I think, think this. I think this is cooler. It's just not. It's not on the top end of playable cards. Um, yeah. of, and of these, I still think the Jeskai one is the best. I think we're going in reverse order of quality, probably. Um, okay. Maybe this one's better than the one we just talked about. Aluna, Apex of Wishes, two green, blue, red. Mutate, three. Red, green, hybrid, blue, blue. Flying Trample, whenever this creature mutates, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land permanent card, put that card on the battlefield or into your hand. Um, one, thing, one thing's for sure about this card, this and Foil is going to look so sick. Oh, it's yeah. such a cool looking card. I would say the art on all of these is kind of next level. Yeah. Even like Brocco's really, the really, boring really one. Cool. Yeah, I'm into all of these. Um, this card... Cascades into a free thing, so like technically, if you mutate, you get an Abercle in play. If you build your deck in a weird way, uh, I don't think this card. I think this card is just not modern playable, though. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I think there's even better. We talked about last week better cards for cheating stuff in the play from the set, right? Isn't there a different the red the red uh, planeswalker? Okay. And even him, we were like, meh. Um, all right. So the last thing to talk about 
is is there a dedicated mutate deck? And 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 this comes with Zagoth Mamba, which is the one black nightmare snake one one. Whenever this creature mutates, it gives uh, a, a creature an opponent controls minus two minus two until end of turn. And the other mutate, uh, what's it called? Helper. Uh, Polywog Symbiote, one blue frog. Each creature spell you cast costs one less to cast if it has mutate. Whenever you cast a creature spell, if it has mutate, draw a card, then discard a card. Um, interesting thing about the cost reduction on this card is it's not if the card has... It doesn't make mutate cost one less. It makes creatures with mutate cost one less. So it's a little bit better than I when I first read it. I don't know if they're... We talked about, like, chaining mutate cards is very powerful. I've now done this before. Like, uh, uh, in, in Standard, in Commander, or Brawl. We don't have real cards. <laughs> they don't exist yet. Uh, and in Limited, that's a very powerful engine. I don't know if there's the right power level in Modern. Though, the combo of, like, Poliwa, this, Gem Razor, and the Octopus is a combo of cards that are all playable, right? And then a medium two-drop or one-drop. And the Polywog Symbiote, uh, Loose. It, it makes the mutate cost and the creature. So, like, if you mutate, mutate cost one less. But if you just cast the creature, you also cost one less? Correct. correct. Either way. All, mute, all the creatures we've talked about cost one less, which is one of the problems we've had with all of them is that they all are kind of expensive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Polywog. But, like, so something something really interesting about, about that is, like, I've always thought about those cost reducer creatures. I've always been a fan of those, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, Goblin Electromancy is a great example for all, like, these are the ones I've always paid attention to. The difference between playing like that and a rampant growth, mm-hmm. you know, or like a Lanar Elf, mm-hmm. it's different, certainly, because you can get more cheap spells and you can chain, can chain them together, like you're saying, but it's also really hard when the thing you're accelerating with comes down on turn two and doesn't do anything. Because mm-hmm. now you have to untap and the big thing you're doing happens on turn three. And it's not like we have a bunch of mutators that otherwise would cost two. Now it can cost one. And, and they're going to be amazing. Like most of the good mutate things, the mutate cost is at least three, if not four, five. So probably what's happening is you're getting like a four drop mutate, for three. and like that, you know, that's fine. But that's right. not breaking. Right, right, right. I realize actually we have missed one mutate card uh, as the final one to talk about, and then we can move on. I think this is actually really good. Is Parcel Beast? This is two green blue elemental beast. It's mutate is blue green. Uh, it's a two four. You may pay one mana and tap it. Look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you may put it onto the battlefield. If you don't put the card onto the battlefield, you put it into your hand. So it is um, Coiling Oracle. Coiling Oracle. Taps for Coiling Oracle, and it also taps at instant speed. I I was expecting the end of that to say activate this ability only any time you can activate activate a sorcery. Yeah, so, so like on turn three, you can have a creature in play do this, use the ability, getting an extra land into play, and you end up with a 2-4. And it's, you know, two mana for a 2-4 is really on curve uh, or powerful in general. Now it's two mana for a 2-4 that you get rid of the other creature you have. Um, yeah. But I, 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 and I do think I've seen people throw kind of like different, like now there's so many different effects that are like Uro, like this, like, um, uh, the, what's the other one? The, the spell-based one? Blue-green, draw card, play land at instant speed. Oh, uh, Grow Spiral? Grow Spiral. Like, there's so many different cool ways of doing this that you can make a deck that just turns through the top of your deck so quickly and ramps so quickly in a pretty powerful way. You play the one mana 0-3 that lets you put a land from your hand into play. Um, yes. Uh, Abril Glazer. Uh, Abril Glazer. One mana Abril Glazer. Then you can play this on Abril Glazer using the extra land you yep. put into play with it to use this ability to get another land. So on turn one, two, on turn three you would have five lands in play. <laughs> okay. If you if you don't whiff on the... Or, or you drew an extra card, right? Like either one. And then and you have a 2-4 with haste yeah, if you want to attack. Seems sweet enough. That is it for Mutate. So, I think Mutate has a chance of seeing play in Modern. I thought going into this, and that's kind of why we saved it the last episode, I was like very off of it. I think some of them are very bad. But I think that between the Octopus, the Artifact Enchantment Destruction guy, um, the Parcel Beast... Uh, and the Jess guy, uh, legendary creature. I think those four all have like real potential to see play. And yeah. then there's a step below that of a few cards that like would be cute, like the cat, right? The cat lord. Um, and maybe those are my five. If I had to pick a top five mutate cards, those are the top five off the top of my head. Yeah. Disagree on any of them? I think so. I like, I like, I like mutate. I think it's cool. Um, I like it better than I like bestow. It feels like it has a lot more going for it in terms of just like. It feels similar, but it also feels like more exciting. 
Um, Mut- mutate and like bestow was built in a way that made it so there was zero card advantage or disadvantage, right? Like if they blew up your thing, you got a creature. If they didn't blow up a thing, you got the pump. There was no moment that they could, even if they killed your creature while the thing was bestowed, you then got the bestow creature, right? It, so it was always just like a, that. that's where the advantage was built in. But because of that, they were just like weird pump spell. They're weird auras that became creatures at some point. Here, all of the value is built into that mutate trigger. And so they all have a cool effect that draws you a card basically when they come into play. Yeah. Which is just, which means there's more variety of what the benefit is, which means there's a higher potential of one of these cards seeing play than a bestow card. All right. So now we're going to talk about non mutate cards. So the first one, uh, and this was also uh, brought up by the, the nobles of House Modern, uh, Shevel Bane of Monsters. This is black green. Uh, legendary creature, human rogue, death touch. At the beginning of your upkeep, if your opponent controls no permanents with bounty counters on them, put a bounty counter on target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. Whenever a permanent in opponent controls with a bounty counter on it dies, gain three life and draw a card. It is a 1-3 for green and black. Um, this is a card advantage engine, right? Like this gives the ability to Jun to just keep killing your opponent's stuff and drawing cards off of that stuff. So your removal spells now all draw you a card. Um... I'm, it is a 1-3 with Death Touch that also is, like, relevant, right? Like, it just is a very defensive creature. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think at this point they're being, it seems like they're being somewhat careful with the design of these, like, two-mana, these two-mana um, uh, Golgari creatures. Like, you know, it, it feels like they don't want to just keep pushing that direction over and over again. It's fine. I like the flavor of the bounty. I like that's cool because we had bounty counters before in standard. It's going to be interesting for this to curve into the Abzan Vindicate. I think the fact that this is a little bit defensive and can start killing creatures is something that's legitimate. I mean, Jund is the deck that would play this in modern, right? It's a value engine. I don't think it's better than Bob. I don't think it's better than Ren and Six. So I think I think that that this is worse than those. Now those decks, because of Luros, have moved away from three drops. And maybe they want a, another two-drop card advantage engine now that they don't have Bloodbraid Elf and Liliana the Veil. Um, but even that being said, I think I think that this is just weaker than other options, including just four Loros. Um, next card is Neutralize. One blue, blue, instant, counter-target spell, cycling two. Yeah, so it's cycling cancel. I mean, somebody the other day on Twitter was asking about, like, what's the best what's the best cancel variant? And it was, like, this card versus, like, the Surveil one versus can counter-target activated ability, trigger mm-hmm. ability my cards called um you know there's all different versions of it i i tend to think cycling is pretty strong but i also tend to think modern has a lot of good counter spells i don't think they have a reason to play cancel yeah i think i think you, it's like this or archmage charm right that, that that's what this this is the slot this is really competing against and i think i play archmage charms over this now if i care about the word cycling that's a little bit different um because this allows me to have a counter spell that then triggers my astral drifts or, or astral slides or whatever I want to trigger. So that's a different yeah. conversation. And there are enough cyclers in the set that were added or, or even reasons the cycle that that has a benefit. But I, I agree. Um, the next card, and this card's dope, uh, is Riel the Everwise. One blue red legendary creature, human wizard, zero three. Riel the Everwise gets plus one plus zero for each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard. So not really a zero three. Uh, whenever you discard one or more cards for that for the first time each turn, draw that many cards. So ostensibly, whenever you discard a card, as long you just can't keep going through cards and looting. But the first time you do it, you draw that many cards. So that means if you wheel a fortune and esque effects, you draw fourteen cards. If you um, do any effect like Thardic Reunion, you would draw six cards or five yeah, cards. You draw five cards. Really- so the world is very happy that Faith the is no longer a card. <laughs> yes, this with Faith the Looting would have been an insane card. Uh, this on turn three, even if Faith the Looting on turn one, just to get spells in your graveyard, and then this, then on turn four, playing Faith the Looting and discarding, drawing, drawing two cards, discarding two cards, drawing two cards is very powerful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I think there's you mentioned uh, you mentioned you know, the octopus, all the Ophidian effects. There's also a lot of those looter effects and like. I, I would play this card alongside like a Looter Ill Core kind of a situation. Like there's there's a lot of those that are just incidentally pretty good. Right. You know, draw this card. I mean Jace, you know, little Jace. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Little Jace is really good with Riel. There's just like a bunch of reasons to discard cards. Like even like imagine this in play with Liliana the Veil. Totally. That seems 
crazy. <laughs> well, okay, we both discard. I'll drop. <laughs> um, and and she's a pretty re- legitimate threat. Three mana for like a what could be a seven three on turn four is like very good. Like I can make her fair. Like there's a reason that we were all playing that Drake for a hot second in, in, in blue red Phoenix decks. And this does a lot of what blue red Phoenix wants. That's another card to really talk about with it, right? Like Phoenix loves this card because it lets you cycle all those ways to get Phoenixes into your graveyard. And then this is the other threat, right? Phoenix thing in the ice and Riel together makes a pretty, pretty decent combo of, of both engine cards and threats. She's also the uh, Augury, Augur, uh, yeah. from um, the uh, Dark Crystal. Oh, yeah. Okay. I see that. Right, <laughs> right. She has the, like, the Earth thing behind her, the, the, the like, geoscopes, um, and she's got, like, the same kind of outfit and horns. She's a human, um, which I feel like has more to do with power level than anything else from this set. Um, also, she's a human wizard, which is not irrelevant creature types on either mm-hmm. end. She like combines a lot of different things that are have been good on other creatures. My only concern with Rael is like a lot of those three mana is it draw card engine cards. They really struggle to get off the ground. So think about it costing three and not two is just very challenging. Like but Jory the, and Ruin Diver is like a good example of a card where it like that should have been sweet. It's a two three and and to trigger it is hard, right? Like you have to cast you have to draw two cards a turn. You cast two cards a turn versus discarding cards as a cost is eliminated and this is a huge threat right like the reason those cards are normally bad is because it's like three mana for a two two that maybe draws you a card a turn this is three mana for a very large three that definitely draws you a card as long as you have it in your deck (laughs) it's definitely it's definitely pushed well the fact that it like acts as a combo piece kind of and as well as functions in the world of just a good threat, that's what you want in a card. It does two things that you want. That's a card I'm looking for. Um, the next card to talk about is Shredded Sails. One in red, choose one, destroy target artifact, or Shredded Sails deals four damage to target creature worth flying, or you can cycle it. Which is kind of choose one of three. Uh, it's options. So it's kind of a red charm, right? You get to destroy an artifact, draw a card, or do four damage to a creature with flying. Um, I just I just think the templating of these cards, like these these, these uh, charmish cyclers, is like great. Yeah. These, give, like give me the ability to cycle this away, and I can main deck a card that you're telling me it can like kill a big flyer, mm-hmm. have a mm-hmm. shatter, or just draw me a card. Like, yep. That seems better than most charms. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Next kind of on that cycle is Wilt. One green, instant, destroy target artifact or enchantment, cycle two. I, I think I can't remember if I talked to you about this on the first episode or when, but again, stri- like, cancel that cycles. Naturalize that cycles. Like, these are, all of a sudden, the whole idea of best of one is clearly taking off, and I, I'm here for it. Mm-hmm. I love mm-hmm. that these cards have cycling. I hated cards like that. They were relegated to limited sideboards, right? You can name deck these cards in limited now. Mm-hmm. All about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, next card. Skull Prophet, uh, also known as Soup Elf. <laughs> black and a green human druid. Tap, make a black or green mana. Uh, it is a 3-1. So it's a 3 mana, 3-1 three for 2. And then you can tap it to put two cards of your library into your graveyard. I'm personally excited about this card. I'm excited for formats where I'm playing weird value deck engines that like getting stuff in my graveyard and I need stuff like a mana fixer, mana ramp, and the ability to put stuff into my graveyard. But this this is an elf that does draw you cards in the late game, right? That's something to always kind of pay attention to. It is two mana. It is for a 3-1, which is an, not an irrelevant body. Um, what are your thoughts on the soup profit? Uh, well, so it's, it's he's, reminiscent he's of soup. that. You can see the card art here. <laughs> he's making soup. He's like looking at soup. Um, I like this card. I think this card is cool. It's not an elf. You said it was an elf. I don't know if you just mean in terms of its mana yeah, creation. Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was forgetting that I should, it's super profit, not soup elf. I forgot profit. It's an insane. Um, but I do think it's interesting. Do you remember the card from, I think it was from Guild of Ravnica, one of the Ravnica sets? It's a 3 1 in black green for two. And then at the battlefield, I think you mill the top three and put a land card from your graveyard on top of your library. Yes. It was, it was, it, Yes, I know. Yeah, that's the card. I like that card a lot. Mm-hmm. That card is sweet. I played that card in Limited. I actually played that card for a while in my Jun deck in Highlander because I, I mm-hmm. like the aggressive nature of a three-power creature on turn two that had like, upside. Like, that's, 
I, if you tell me that a two mana creature has three power and upside, you can often convince me I can play that card. The problem this card. Yeah, sorry, continue. Finish. This card is even a little better than that idea because, like, that one, you know, best case scenario, you were skipping a you were skipping a uh, draw step to get yourself a land, right? Like, it was just putting mm-hmm. it on top. But this card is just a two mana three one that can then accelerate you, and then later in the game has the has the ability to like fuel your delve cost for anglers and do all kinds of things like that. Like, it's I think this card's actually very good. It's it's in that what's the what's the Seder Seder Wayfinder? It's in that Seder yep. Wayfinder design space, right? Where now. I still think Sarah Wayfinder is the best version of this, right? It comes into play, you automatically get cards in your graveyard, and you have a 1-1 in play. This is the closest we've gotten, though, because it you don't guarantee get stuff in your graveyard. You're sacrificing the, like, trigger to put stuff in your graveyard and get a land uh, into your hand for just a Birds of Paradise that's in play. Or not Birds of Paradise, but a, 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 a creature that taps for green and black into play. And then you can use that either to tap for mana, or if you don't need that mana... You can mill yourself, or you can be aggressive and attack with your three one. Like it, 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 it like is slightly better in every way other than the one way that it's worse, um, and that's the instant gratification of Seder Wayfinder. And it's interesting that it, it, I'd, I'd like to see how much play this sees. It, it, it's pretty cool to me. Um, yeah. Next cat is Sky Cat Sovereign, white blue elemental cat flying one one. Sky Cat Sovereign gets plus one plus one for each other creature you control with flying. Two blue white create a one one white cat bird creature token with flying. Okay, so sky cat. It's not so different than Pride of the Clouds, right? That's kind of that's the throwback. Yeah, I believe so. It's a Pride of the Clouds where you get to on in battlefield play for pay the extra mana to create the tokens versus have it in your hand. And you get so Pride the, of, Yep. Yeah, so Pride of the Clouds for anybody who's watching and doesn't remember is way back from Ascension, I think. It's blue white for a one one flying elemental cat. Flying, Pride of the Clouds gets plus one, plus one for each other creature in play. Flying, and that has this ability called Forecast, blue, white, two, reveal Pride of the Clouds from your hand, put a one, one, white, and blue bird creature token with flying into play. You can activate the ability only during your upkeep and only once this turn. So, it does feel like Skycat Sovereign is supposed to be an updated version of Pride of the Clouds. Right. And, um, right. It's cool that you can play them together. It's weak, it's... Yeah, that is cool, actually. But it, it, it's weaker to removal, right? Like it, but you get the benefit of just being able to spend as much mana as you want to put one ones into play. Like, like yeah. in, you don't have to like do the weird sorcery based tempo play of making one ones every turn. Um, and it's just a threat on its own that you now you just want to run this out, right? There's not as much of a hard choice. I'm like, oh, do I keep it in my hand to make one ones as a value engine, or do I just go out of the way to put it into play? Um, it, it's interesting. Next card is Slither Wisp, blue, black, black, creature, elemental, nightmare, flash. Whenever you cast another spell that has flash, you draw a card with each opponent, and each opponent loses one life. Yeah, that's, that's cool. The card didn't quite stand out to me as, like, anything revolutionary, but, but cool. I don't, like, so, the place I see it is is the fairies and our flash decks, right? Like, fairies has always been very close to playable. The tribal components of fairies are just fine. It's more of the, like, playing with a bunch of good flash spells that are powerful that then let me keep my mana open for all the counter magic stuff we talked about earlier in this episode. And this lets you do that, right? Like, you can just hold this up and then just make sure you have Snapcaster Mage. Like, Snapcaster Mage after this is an insane play. If I, like, bolt, hold my mana up, play this on turn, uh, their their turn four or their turn three at the end of their turn, then on my next turn just am able to, like, Snapcaster Bolt draw a card. Like, that's pretty nutso. I don't know. I, I like didn't like this card at first either, but then I like read it more. I so I understand. So I understand the things that are cool. What I like about this card is that this is the thing thing we were talking about the two three curve. So the three into four curve on this card, if your land drops, is strong because you flash it out on the turn on turn three. If they don't kill it, now probably you have open your ability to have like you said mana leak on turn two or remand it or whatever, and then snapcaster to flash that spell back on turn four to get your card to counter the spell whatever. Um, the thing I don't like about it, though, is that a lot of those decks, and we're seeing it more and more now, I guess they're pushing flash creatures, which is cool, but a lot of those decks are employing powerful spells in modern. They're not just playing a bunch of flash creatures. Like, And it's tough that this card doesn't have evasion, because a 3-mana three 3-2 three is okay, but it's going to get blocked and killed by a lot of things. And but it's better, a lot of the best. it's better when your entire deck is instant speed, right? Like, it's better when... I never let my opponent have a creature in play to block this. Yeah, but the, but a lot of the way that you're not letting them have a creature in play to block this is by playing spells, not flash creatures. It's like 
there there are a certain number of good flash creatures. Snapcaster Mage being the best one. You have like Raising Borrower, and you have like Meek. Like like the, this plays really well with Borrower. Like that's that's like where this card is is at its best, I think, because your ability to spend the two mana to bounce the blocker, but then also have a flash creature stapled onto it that's going to get you value is that's where that's like where this works. Mm-hmm. But Borrower is a very unique card in the sense that you have a spell and a flash creature on the same card. Well, but you can play Borrower, you can play the Octopus, you can play this, you can play the Cycler that counters spells, you can play Vendillion Click, you can play Snapcaster Mage, and then you just play removal spells. And spell setters, right? And spell setters, right? Like, that's a Sprite. lot of good cards. Sprites, the, Sprites, to me, Sprites the card that, like, I'm trying to decide if, if this card gets pushed over the edge for me, and Sprites the card that makes that decision. Because it's like, all the rest of the cards you mentioned, none of those function as just a hard counter spell for cheap. But in modern, there's enough times where spell spell sprites going to just like counter path, counter bolt, counter fatal push, counter thoughts and ease. Well, but like how many cards do you have to drop this card to make it worth it, right? You're still getting a flash 3 2 threat that they have to deal with. But then from that point on, every other one of these cards draws you a card. That's I fair. Like, yeah. you could, like if you like just played with four flash creatures four of them, you know, like, so there's 12 in your deck and the rest is spells. The rest is our mana leaks and lightning bolts and path and, and, and paths or whatever you need remands. I feel like that gets pretty far. Plus you can play stuff like, like Venser, right? You can play, there are creatures that counter spells that have flash. If you play this in like a, 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 a salt eye list, you could play even just hard counter spells like um, the three, two thrilled mystic. That's really sick with spell queller. Queller is the card. That's the other card that I'm like, you play this in an Esper list. I love the idea of Spell Queller coming down, drawing a card and making you lose a life. Like, come on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's so good. And the, the cool thing about this card is that this type of effect normally has the problem that it has... It doesn't have flash, right? Like, the the, the Grim Prophet, yeah. or Grim whatever, that, like, whenever a creature dies, draw a card that you control. Like, it's a three-mana sorcery creature that's a 3-2. This is... Oh, right. Has flash, though, and the ability to just only play this one convenient... Like, you never have to play this card. You can just not play it and counter their spells or pretend you had counter magic and, like, skip a turn to next level them. I think it's powerful. Um, next card is the Ozolith. One mana. Just one mana. It's a legendary artifact. Whenever a creature you control leaves the battlefield, if it had a counter on it, put those counters on the Ozolith. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if the Ozolith has counters on it, you may move all counters from Ozolith onto target creature. This card is dope. This card's dope for a lot of reasons. I still haven't seen the actual answer to how this works with modular. Um, I had two different judges of the same level tell me conflicting answers. Uh, so I would, and this was before the full set was released. So there might be an FOQ out that explained this. So uh, comments, I would love to know uh, if I have Ravager and I have a Ornithopter in play and I sack Ravager to put the two plus one plus one counters onto that Ornithopter, does Ozolith also get two plus one plus one counters? Hi, everyone. Producer Marshall here. Uh, I just wanted to pop in with uh, the fact that we have the answer to the Ozolith question, and it's the best possible version. Basically, the Ozolith and Modular's reminder texts are shorthand. What they actually mean for both Modular cards and for the Ozolith is when a creature with counters on it dies, you then get to put an equivalent number of counters onto the Ozolith. Or with modular creatures, when a creature with modular dies, you get to put an equal number of plus one plus one counters as it had on itself on an artifact creature. Therefore, if you have the Ozolith in play and a modular creature dies, you get both the modular trigger and you put an equivalent number of counters on the Ozolith. Yeah, no, but this card's cool. Like, it does a lot of really cool things. It does stuff that, like, art, like, I think this reinvigors my hardened scales, like, activities a lot. The fact that this is an artifact that could be sacked to Ravager helps. The fact that these counters get doubled when they put on creatures, there's a lot of cool things you could do there. There's also, like, weird counters that you can gain advantage of that aren't um, plus one, plus one. All the new stuff, like the flying counters, that's why this card exists, right? And this says because you can, like, put trample counters on different creatures. Correct if I'm wrong, but, like, Dusk Urchins, you draw cards, pull the number of counters on them. Is that right? One black, two, whenever. Um, yeah, Dusk Urchin attacks or blocks, put a minus one, minus one counter out. Whenever Dusk Urchin is put into a graveyard from play, yeah. you draw a card for each one. So that's kind of so dope. Yeah. Like it, so now it goes into the graveyard and you draw three cards and then and then it, they all go onto the Ozolith mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. you kill something next turn with those counters. Yeah, you can move minus one, minus one counters onto their creatures from creatures you control. That's kind of fun. Well, but there's a card that, like, the negative effect of this card is it comes into play with negative counters, right? And then you can, like, this in play, 
and Kitchen Finks dying the second time, you can move that minus oh. one, minus one counter onto one of their creatures. You just like gain a little bit of value. All right, next card, Titanoth Rex. And, and this also goes with Space Godzilla. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Space Godzilla, um, but uh, they are the two big cyclers. Seven green green, it's an 11-11 dinosaur beast trample. One, cycling one green, whenever you cycle Titanoth Rex, put a trample counter on target creature you control. More importantly, this is just at 11-11 for any type of reanimator situation. If it then can be a threat that you put in the plan, has trample as an 11-11. High enough racks. I mean, every time they print a giant thing that you can cycle away in the living index, that they're significant. Like an 11-11 creature that cycles for two, you're not alone. It's not alone. If you're just living in the turn three, it might be enough. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Speaking of which, did we talk about Yudaro? I don't think we did. Uh, Yudaru Wandering Monster. Five red red legendary creature dinosaur turtle. It is an 8-8. Eight, eight. It has trample and haste. Cycling one in a red. When you cycle Yudaru Wandering Monster, shuffle it into your library from your graveyard. If you've cycled a card named Yudaru Wandering Monster four or more times this game, put it onto the battlefield from your graveyard instead. Do this before you draw, just for clarification. Um, this card's nuts. I mean, like, A is a card draw advantage in red. Like, you can just keep cycling it, right? And and it's, you just always want to cycle it. You never want to cast it. But then the fourth time you draw this card, you get a Trample Haste 8-8. Eight, eight. This is already seeing a ton of play in Standard Mono Red. I believe it's seeing play in, in um, uh, Pioneer already. And um, um, I, I think this is definitely a card that could see play in Modern. Yeah, I think so too, man. I think um, there's also there's also cool stuff because it's legendary. Um, where I mean, you could certainly build the deck to just be playing like creature tutors, right? Like, but, and I think spending your your delirium creature tutor to just like search this guy up so you have a higher likelihood of just hitting them is fine. Um, there's also other tutors. I mean, you can time of need get you a legendary creature. Time of need is just a two mana tutor that can get you this card in your hand. And I think playing this on its own just as a good card that has value is cool. And then the fact that, I mean, you mentioned him on a red. I think that's especially cool. Because, like, the fact that it's 8 8 haste. When you draw the fourth copy, all it's often just going to be like, all right, two man. Like, like in Scred, in Scred, this card, like, is a, is, is like a, a draw engine that you need, right? It, it cycles through your deck, so you keep getting cards you want. It keeps going back in your deck, so you can get the additional ones to eventually win with it, right? I, like, you talk about tutoring. I don't know if you need the tutor. This card draws you into the next one. And... Those decks also have different ways from Koth to Chandra that getting the seven mana is not that hard. And you just cast it to trample haste eight, eight. That's totally good on its own. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm excited I'm by this card. Okay, so this is the last card we're going to talk about until we get a bunch of comments of cards that we didn't talk about. And we would love to see those comments. So please tell us because next week we might do an addendum or maybe a hot take that is a quick go through of cards we haven't talked about. But Whirlwind of Thought, one blue, red, white enchantment. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, draw a card. Um, I think that the biggest issue with this card is it's expensive. Like four mana and three colors is a little bit hard to get in the play. But... Once this is in play, you win. So, <laughs> yeah. The issue with this card is that Jeskai Ascendancy does this kind of better for three, really. Like, it's it's not quite the same thing, obviously, because you're looting. This card kind of does the same thing. It's just, it costs one more, and it doesn't have the, ex- like the extra things that make Jeskai Ascendancy like a combo card. Mm-hmm. Um, but this also is just like four mana, draw a million cards. Like you so, don't have the discard, so like you don't have to like chain the way that Jeskai Ascendancy does. This card though also allows Jeskai Ascendancy to have like its fifth one, right? Like it, worst case scenario, you have this one and you don't have the ability to untap stuff, but you like draw four cards every turn. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting. I don't. I agree. I think Jeskai Ascendancy is better. Um, oh, I did miss a card. Oh, I know what the last card is. Sorry, people of the world, that we keep saying there's a last card. Um, this card is better than I thought it was going to be, uh, and I'm interested to talk about it and hear your opinions. This is Whisper Squad. Uh, oh, dude, I love this card. This Are you is... kidding? I, I, guess, I, I guess I didn't realize you hadn't talked about this. Yeah, card. it's one black for a 1-1. One, one. Search your library for, uh, you then, comes into play, it's a human soldier, one black, one, one. Uh, you may pay one and a black, search your library for a card named Whisper Squad, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. It does not tap to do this. So on turn one... Play Whisper Squad. On turn two, you find another Whisper Squad. Comes in the play tapped. On turn three, you attack with those, and you, and you find a third one. Or you can wait till turn four and get two of them into play, uh, getting all onto your deck. It's kind of like Squadron Hawks. It's like Squadron Hawk that cost one mana for the first one. 
and is like a little bit more susceptible to removal. Uh, but it, 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 and doesn't play with like Jace the Mind Sculptor the way that Squadron Hawk does, right? It doesn't draw you cards, it puts them into play. This card's sweet though. There's definitely gonna be ver- like there's a there's gonna be like a version of this card where you are playing abilities that allow you to reshuffle your graveyard or put cards from the graveyard back into your library often, um, and you have an infinite ability for two mana to just like have a creature on the battlefield. But I also just think that this card is generally pretty cool. Like I, I just yeah. think it's unique. Yeah, agreed. it's very cool. It's instant speed, it's cheap to get a creature. Like it draws cards essentially, but also like, I'm on the battlefield. Uh, I've and and like back in the day and and recently I actually accidentally booted it up on Moto when I didn't have a large collection, there was stuff like mana traders where you can kind of rent collections. Um because I didn't own Tarmogoyfs, because I didn't own like random pieces for Ja, uh, uh, Abzan decks, I was playing like a Lingering Souls and Squadron Hawks deck. And it just played four Squadron Hawks, and 90% of what it was doing was just being like things that it could attack and then could block and would die, and it just would be card advantage that I was drawing. And between that and Lingering Souls, I would outvalue them. Um, this does that better for what that deck was trying to do, right? So, like, the fact that this doesn't have to be in your hand, it's not letting up what you're doing, the fact that you can just play them for one mana when you draw them, right? Like, if it, they're cheaper if you draw them than they are even in play. I think this card's really cool. I like this design, too. I love the idea of, like, it's, like, a very cool card. Yeah, it's sick. <laughs> what if what, what if Whisper Squad said you may play any number of Whisper Squad cards named Whisper Squad in your deck? That would have just been the most stupid card ever. I, well, I think the problem with that is if it's too good, it's unfun. But otherwise, it's dope. As long as it was bad, I'd love that card. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 1-1 one, one for 1. I can't, can't do that much. You can. So what's the worst? <laughs> so like, with Training Grounds, you can on turn 1 play Training Grounds. On turn 2, get 2 Whisper Squads into play. On turn yeah, 3... So you can still only just play 1 Whisper Squad on the land and activate. Yeah, so you get 2. On, on turn okay, 2, sure. you get 2. On turn three, you would have five. On turn... So you'd swing for two. Yeah, that's not even that good. And that's with training grounds, making this, like, infinitely better. There's probably, like, a lot of cool stuff that that could do that we aren't thinking about. But I, I did think about it. That if, yeah. if the wording on that had existed, do you, I think it would have made this card legendary. It already feels really cool. Yeah. I feel like it would have pushed it into, like, legend status. You could play any number of Whisper Squads. Yeah, yeah I got like, the Whisper Squad deck. Uh, like, I, like, I think that you would sack... The, the place it gets scary is, like, sack outlets, right? Like, you would always have a creature to sacrifice. Yeah. But that's not that much better than bringing something like Skeleton. No, I mean, you're just... There are one ones for one. Yeah. You'd have, have, yeah. have to have some way to make humans or soldiers... Love it. Like, love it. Let's play in this card. Let's let's do it. Let's just break the rules. <laughs> Rule zero in modern, everybody. All right. Um, that is it for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Thank you so much for our patrons for making this episode happen. Uh, make sure to check our Patreon out. There's a bunch of new stuff, including the Noble House, where uh, before every episode, we do like a uh, almost like a meetup where we all jump on Discord and get to hang out. Plus, they get exclusive access to the Noble House uh, on the Discord channel that's just only nobles are available. Uh, but there's also a bunch of other cool stuff on Patreon. If you can't get to the $25 level, there's uh, the full raw feed of the episode is there every week. So like all of the weird editing mistakes or the cards that Marshall heard us talk about during these reviews that were just bad and didn't need to be in the episode. You get those exclusively on Patreon. Um, you also get to see uh, just a bunch of other cool stuff. Make sure to check it out. We, you should follow us on all social media. I'm at Kess Wiley everywhere. You guys can find me at Ben Nate. Ba- oh. <laughs> you guys can find me at Ben Baker Media everywhere. The other thing I was going to throw here. out there, uh, you guys have already subscribed, I'm sure. Please do if you're not. Um, I just launched this new thing. It just launched. It's called Nerds and Suits. It's a company I've wanted to launch for a very long time. It's a YouTube channel and a podcast feed. It currently launches with two shows, one-on-one interviews called The Great Conversation. The other show is called Song from the Scene. I'm basically spending five minutes talking to you guys about the greatest songs and the greatest scenes ever. And then I'm performing them on my guitar covered so the first one is up now it's uh, time after time cindy lopper from romeo michelle's head for the union i had a lot of fun doing it so go check out youtube.com slash nerds in suits and subscribe it would mean everything to me i'm really trying to build that time. yep and make sure to follow uh on twitch so i'm uh at or twitch.tv slash cast wiley i do twitch streams from magic to arena to final fantasy 9 to other really fun things and, and it's always a blast i might try some valorant i got access to the beta which is the new 
Riot Games first person shooter. And thank you guys so much. We'll talk to you guys next week. <laughs> this has been a production of Time Traveler Media, sending podcasts into the future.